His topic is shallow AC deep problems, and he will tell you the meaning of IZHV. And uh, for acute intraoperative aqueous misdirection in phaco emulsification. Please take a seat, uh, you know. Thank you, sir. Uh, really a pleasure and honor, and thanks to AIOS for uh, the award and the keynote lecture. Can we have the presentation? I can see the presentation. Thank you. And as you heard, uh, it is about acute fluid misdirection and iridozonula vitrectomy in that acute setting. So we did a retrospective study to assess the outcomes of IZHV as the treatment for acute intraoperative acute fluid misdirection. And this was over a period of five years that we were able to find uh, six, seven cases, Sir, seven cases. The acute fluid misdirection was defined. Please uh, pay attention to that. Acute shallowing of the anterior chamber with iris prolapse, inability to inject viscoelastic, forward movement of the capsular bag, intraocular lens, or the phacic lens with a normal fundus glow and external factors being ruled out. And the confirmatory finding that these findings are resolved when IZHV is performed. Sorry, I went in the wrong direction. So there are a few external causes which need to be ruled out first. So this is just a uh, protocol or table which one can actually follow to reach a diagnosis whenever you start seeing a very shallow, tense uh, globe with shallow anterior chamber. If you obviously see a brown mound or the loss of fundal glow, you can be quite sure of a suprachoroidal uh, hemorrhage or a large choroidal effusion happening. And in that case, you have to just close everything, uh, go back to your prayer room and hope everything is fine next day. And based on uh, the clinical and ultrasound findings, manage it uh, thereafter. However, if you don't see a loss of glow, you have to rule out an external factor like the patient straining because of holding breath, wanting to urinate, coughing, or the speculum being tight. And they have to be managed, of course, accordingly. Once that is ruled out, we have to uh, ask the patient if the patient is feeling any pain. Any suprachoroidal hemorrhage or an effusion is likely to be associated with severe pain, and hence, once all of these are ruled out, we reach the, the diagnosis of intraoperative fluid misdirection as a diagnosis of exclusion for which an IZHV can be performed. Now we uh, noted everything, the anterior and posterior chamber findings, the visual field biometry, uh, reviewed the surgical video and kept a special eye on further shallowing of the anterior chamber in the postoperative period. Now this is a rare condition. Uh, very few uh, occasions in your life you will find this and uh, only because we deal with uh, these large number of cases we have been able to collect these seven cases. Uh, three of them, four of them were undergoing a combined cataract and glaucoma surgery and three of them were phaco emulsifications. Uh, four again were angle closures and uh, one of them was a pseudo exfoliation glaucoma. One of them was a normal non-glaucomatous eye with high myopia and one of them was a uh, open angle glaucoma. I'll just use this video to demonstrate what I'm talking about. It all belong, uh, started very easily, calmly as a patient uh, who was undergoing a cataract surgery, open angle glaucoma, high myop, and you see, uh, I'll just pay attention to this floater here in the center on how it has moved from periphery to the center and seems to be coming up near. And after the IA, when the AC was left shallow for a while, it became very difficult. The globe became tensed. The posterior capsule was getting stuck to the anterior capsule and iris kept on prolapsing. Any attempts to dilate or form the anterior chamber by injecting viscoelastic was failing. The viscoelastic would be vomited out. And then I had a dilemma. 
I had the option of either stopping here and abandoning the surgery, proceeding the next day. Even, even attempts to inject the intraocular lens failed. Call a colleague from the vitro-retinal surgery department or do something that we regularly do for a chronic aqueous misdirection. So I decided to do an IZHV. And you see the vitrector going into the peripheral iris at a site which is not hidden by an incision. And if you watch carefully, you will find a point of time where you see the pupillary snap sign, not a something, a sign that the anterior segment surgeon welcomes. But here, it was the landmark of things going right. So as the anterior hyoid face is broken, there is a sudden change in the dynamics of the eye. And after this pupillary snap sign, everything went on well. And the eye started behaving completely normally. And I was able to complete the surgery uneventfully. Now, these are the settings that were used for that particular machine. Or most of these patients, we were using the Alcon Infinity at that point of time. Uh, very importantly, during the iridectomy, the cut rate has to be low with a high vacuum. And the direction always has to be away from the ciliary processes and the iris root. And while going through the capsules, make sure that you don't damage the capsule too much because then you don't want your intraocular lens hanging up and down. So all of these patients resolved. It means that the anterior chamber was no longer shallow after the procedure in the immediate operative or the post-operative period. None of them had a recurrence. And the intraocular pressure was controlled, though quite a few of them <coughs> required anti-glaucoma medications. There was one patient who needed a uh, NDIAG hyaluronidotomy for a fibrin membrane uh, that had formed at the site of the uh, uh, IZHV. Uh, apart from routine steroids and antibiotics, we did use atropin and a combination of tropicamide and phenylephrine, which were very carefully tapered over two to four week blocks. Now the it's eight minutes. Uh, if you you have to, it's eight minutes. Eight actually. minutes. Is yeah. it? Just give me one minute. Okay. Uh, the confusion in the terminology is also matched by the confusion in management. While the acute condition has never been reported to be managed by IZHV, IZHV is considered the gold standard for a chronic aqueous misdirection. Same pathology, but this treatment has not been used. So we happen to be the first uh, series to actually publish this. Uh, as, as a modality of management, and uh, the outcomes have been good. And That's with this uh, intraoperative technique and postoperative careful medical management, the anterior segment surgeon, I believe, can carefully, uh, successfully manage this dangerous condition. I think this is a Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Siddharth. Uh, at some point, we need more time for you to tell us more about it. Thank you so much, and congratulations once again. Thank you, sir. So, um, I'm going to call this. Dr. Ashwini Kumar Behra, yeah. Uh, so Dr. Ashwini Kumar is going to talk about uh, Trabulosi syndrome, unveiling the mysteries of a rare disease. Can you click on the next slide? You call so that you know you guys will call. Yeah. Uh, fine, good morning to one and all <coughs> and respected teachers on the dais. I will present on a uh, very rare disease known as Trabulosi syndrome, which I encountered. When the 39 year old male complained with chief complaint of further diminution of vision in the right eye, complaint of low vision for the last few years, and complaint of outward deviation. This is a main complaint. Patient of social status was very poor. Patient came from Jammu Kashmir. This is an initial photo. When you look at it, by looking at the picture, you can see something is not normal apart from uh, divergent squint. So there was a clinical examination. There was a diffuse blade-like structure around the limbus, IOP of 6 millimeter in the right eye and the 10 millimeter in the left eye. No history of any surgery, no history of any trauma. In the right eye, there is sedal positive at 3 o'clock. Younger brother have similar picture, and uh, no photo was there. And there is history of consanguineous marriage. <laughs> if you look at the picture, it's like a convex iris configuration here. Convex iris configuration with uh, Lower, lower tip, lower nose, 
So anterior cyclic examination, if you see, there is a, uh, this cornea anomaly, or there is a thin cystic blood like structure here. If you see here, there is a blood formation in the right eye. In the left eye also, there is superior blood formation, or you can see here in the blood area. So if you see there is jet black pupil and see there is a cedal positive here, you can see it's a cedal positive. And if you see there is a blab black structure here in the superior part. So a patchy areas of atrophy in the iris, spontaneous blab and blab leak acidal positive. So on dilated examination, you see there is a supernasal subluxation and this microsperophicia. And on gonioscopy, the normal landmarks are not clearly visualized. So the pigmented deposits are here and this is a broad based pass, most likely because of angle dysgenesis. We did a Hiddelberg blab and angle. We see there is a remnant of uh, iris front bridge of the bridging area this year. On the this part, the scan is taken to this part of iris. And this part, you see the angle structure is completely destroyed. And on ASOCT also, there is a cystic blab present here. On UBM also, you see there is tear. You can see with 35 megahertz, we did. And with this, uh, there is a thin cystic part. And uh, on OCT, there is, if you see the uh, normal macular axis that is not there. So this is confirming the hypotonic maculopathy. There are coronal folds present there. So if you summarize, there is spontaneous bleb is there, bleb leak, microsperophagia, which is subluxed crystalline, crystalline lens, big nose, exotropia, gonioscopy angle dysgenesis is there, macular OCT, hypotonic maculopathy, I mean UBM, there's a bleb and cyst uh, cystic space. So when you search the literature, we found this is related to the troublosis syndrome with similar features is there. So on online Mendelian inheritance of men on the art genet where uh, the genetical diseases are reported, the large big nose, ectopia lentis, uh, patchy areas of atrophy, and a vascular elevation of bulbar conjunctiva. So what really happens in this uh, disease, there is a gene mutation in the eight chromosome eight and the aspirational, aspirational beta hydroxysynthesis which adhere the cell. So this molecule is deficient, so th which leads to the uh, atro um, uh, spontaneous blade formation. Only 28 cases has been reported in 11 and 11, and uh, in India, still now six cases are reported. This case is to avoid a reporting. What we did, we did a blab revision by doing conjunctival advancement to correct the hypotonic maculopathy. Patient never came for visit for, for any follow-up or genetic counseling. What, what could be happening or what can be the ophthalmist can do? So there might be progression of sclera thinning because uh, of the genetic deficiency. Blebitis from the bleb leak leading to the bleb related endophthalmitis in other areas of uh, uh, where the spontaneous bleb is formed. So in these scenarios, what can be done? There can be clean, clear corneal uh, lensectomy can be done. Iris claw lens, question mark, because there is patchy areas of atrophy. SFIR also should be avoided because of progressive thinning of sclera. So uh, might be contact lens might be given in such scenarios uh, by doing uh, clear lens, corneal lensectomy. So genetic evaluation of whole family member needed. So the on conclusion, I will say a personalized approach to disease management needed in such scenarios. Prophylactic measures associated with the secondary complications uh, and need to follow up these patients. Uh, genetic disease orders are believed to be incurable. Uh, further genetic counseling are needed. The purpose is uh, this is a very rare case when we face this stage, when we searched, we first time knew there was something called troublosis syndrome also if this existed. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank Bye. you, thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you um, I, uh, that it's all happened by itself, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, what was the location of the bleb formation? Sir, uh, in the right eye, it is on the supratemporal, supranasal, and uh, nasal part. On the left eye, it is almost from uh, extending from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock, and in the nasal okay. part. On the right eye, there is a bleb leak. And were you able to determine the scleral thickness in any way? No, sir. Scleral uh, thickness. Did we, you we did an SOCT picture. There is seems to be scleral thinning, but we didn't measure it. Okay. Did you do an ultrasound to find whether there was a leakage even posterior to the globe? No, sir. Posterior to the globe means uh, 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 <coughs> maculopathy is there. Behind the eye, actually. No. Sorry. No. no. Okay. And uh, what has been the general uh, recovery pattern of these patients across uh, the world, you know? With uh, sir, the, the case report they have suggested there are many very big. They most cases they do a provide contact lens, which gives protection because the lens is removed. They don't put, okay. can put a lens and they do cannot do an SFIL so in just scenario. Uh, just one question. Uh, you said there are only 28, uh, 28, reported, 28 reported yes. cases, right? So how did you confirm this? Did you go for a genetic kind of a so genetic test? Genetic counseling That is what is probably confirmatory. Yes, Otherwise, sir. the rest of the symptoms, they are vague, basically. Yes, sir. All the symptoms I match mean this. The, the signs and the symptoms. Yes. I mean. 
all the signs of the match is that the patient was called for genetic counseling but the patient didn't came for follow up any follow up for father was uh, brother was also same uh, d- disease but cannot took a picture the patient has to be confirmed genetically genetically yes genetically. number one number two you said spherophakia macros spherophakia yeah. that's a very specific term see huh. in this condition uh, it has been reported simply as ectopia lentis how did you diagnose macros be a spherophakia if in this you case? see the pupillary size sir compared to the pupillary size the lens appears to be very small if you see uh, the image the people is dilated in this case actually, yes sir so so even how did you diagnose macrospherophakia the clinical not the way you diagnose macrospherophakia okay. okay and there's no uh, macrospherophakia uh, documented in any of the literature available it's simply ectopia lentis yes sir in cases it is acute glaucoma is uh, reported it's not okay, i'm talking about this particular disease how is trouble syndrome you have used it i mean just like that the p is not seen in not documented anywhere in the literature macrospherophakia is a very specific term please avoid it on trouble syndrome they have reported the anterior migration of lens and uh, they, they have reported the simply ectopia lentis dislocation yeah. okay yeah. Move on to the next uh, okay. speaker so would someone like to invite the next speaker yeah. <coughs> okay yeah. so uh, yeah please go ahead please invite the yeah the the second speaker of the session is uh, uh, dr sudhir pandeke and uh, the presenting author is dr shashi uh, shashil batra shahil batra shahil batra. batra and the topic is critical analysis of saploid stent uh, in mids in primary angle glaucoma primary open angle glaucoma yeah so go ahead please good morning to my dear three uh, it's 5 minutes please stick to the time yes sir my topic for today is critical analysis of saploid stent in mids in primary open angle glaucoma so the main purpose of this study was to show that uh, micro microincision glaucoma surgery is one of the most recent surgical modality in treatment of glaucoma and we have made saploid stent which is a further advancement in this modality it is a cheaper alternative to other glaucoma oh implants yeah, 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 and it costs yeah, roughly yeah, 50 yeah, to 100 yeah, rupees yeah, that is around 1 us dollar and it is very useful in the modern practice SP shunt is very easy to operate and the learning curve is very easy as compared to other glaucoma implants and also it yeah is made up of PMMA material which has been in use for more than 50 years. So the design of this study was uh, Uh, this was a hospital based randomized prospective study which we have taken as a pilot project it included 50 eyes of patients of primary angle glau- pro- open angle glaucoma who were willing to do uh, microincision glaucoma surgery with sp shunt the study site was in the ophthalmology department of a tertiary care hospital inclusion criteria included patients who are diagnosed cases of primary open angle glaucoma and were willing for shunt surgery and exclusion criteria was all other forms of glaucoma including normal tension glaucoma Uh, patients were assessed pre pre operatively history was taken uh, visual acuity best guided visual acuity iop measurement was done by aplanation tonometry uh, gonioscopy was done perimetry was done and fundus examination was done and post operatively patients were followed up at one day one week one month three months six months and one year and uh, various post operative complications were looked out for especially uh, fibrosis of uh, failure of filtration so what is sp shunt so it is this is how it is made basically this is a spheral fixated iol on the right on the left and the distal 3 mm part of the haptic of the iol is uh, cut so sp shunt is basically it is a c shaped uh, implant made of 3 mm and the distal and this implant then has the eyelet of the sf iol which is used to fix the implant in the spheral groove here the steps of the surgery are shown we have shown we have made a superficial partial thickness spheral flap and a spheral groove has been made here we have used a 22 gauge needle to make a passage of roughly 0.7 mm into the anterior chamber and here we can see the sp shunt the proximal 1 mm of the sp shunt is placed into the anterior chamber and the distal 2 mm is placed in the spheral groove and then it is sutured the eye via the eyelet it is sutured using a 10-0 polypropylene suture two such implants are placed in one spheral groove and then the spheral flap is closed and conjunctival flap is closed so observations were first we have seen this is a distri- this is a table showing the distribution of the patients 
the first patient first group has 29 patients with the male preponderance second group has 18 patients with uh, both male and female equal and third group has three patients female this is a table showing the preoperative and postoperative uh, iops of the patients in first group you can see preoperatively the mean iop was 28.62 plus minus 1.25 millimeters of mercury and after one year it was 12.40 plus minus 1.40 millimeters of mercury in the second group it was the mean IOP preoperatively was 33.14 plus minus 2.25 millimeters of mercury and after one year it was 16.12 millimeters of mercury and in the third group the mean preoperative IOP was 40.08 millimeters of mercury and after one year it was uh, around 18.05 millimeters of mercury so the main complications we didn't face any such anterior chamber complications the main complication we found was failure of filtration in the first group one patient had failure of filtration in the second group, three patients had failure of filtration, and in the third group, three patients had failure of filtration. So total of seven uh, patients had failure of filtration out of the 50 patients. So all in all, in conclusion, we can say that uh, microincision glaucoma surgery with salopin shunt is a very effective modality for control and maintenance of IOP in patients with primary open angle glaucoma, and its greatest efficacy is in the range of 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Uh, no major complications were reported other than failure of filtration and therefore we can say even the patients who had failure of filtrations were given anti-glaucoma medications and then IOP was controlled in them and so this procedure is, is very cost effective and uh, is very safe as a newer modality of glaucoma implant surgery. All primary angles. Yes, yes ma'am. Basically, you have to start with two shots. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just, just one query. <coughs> the, the shunt doesn't have a hole. You have used a haptic, right? So basically, <coughs> the shunt, when you close the flap, it prevents the fibrosis of right. the package. So it is just to prevent the fibrosis. Yes, it does not behave like a tube yes. shunt. Ye right. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We're a little bit out of time. We still have nine papers to go. Uh, would someone please call the third speaker? Yes, thank you. Uh, so we've gone on to FX of uh, the, our next speaker. That's Dr. Pradeep Balam. And the topic is going to be effect of glaucoma medications on lipid layer thickness in patients with newly diagnosed glaucoma. Good morning, all. Today I'll be presenting on the effect of glaucoma medications on lipid layer thickness in patients with newly diagnosed glaucoma. Coming to the introduction, intraocular pressure is the only modifiable risk factor in patients with glaucoma. Treatment with topical anti-glaucoma medications is essential to prevent the progression of the disease. I think uh, the slides are not running. Okay. However, the long-term use of glaucoma medications has led to ocular surface disease which is characterized by disruption of the ocular surface integrity, inadequate quantity of tears, and an unstable tear film. LipiView interferometer developed by tear science is a new device that can measure lipid layer thickness quantitatively using interferometry. Materials and methods. Patients attending outpatient department of our hospital and who are newly diagnosed with glaucoma and were treated with topical anti-glaucoma medications forms the source of the study. Three lipid layer thickness parameters, that is maximum, average, and the minimum measured by LipiView were recorded before starting anti-glaucoma medications and after 12 months of treatment. LipiView has an upper cutoff of 100 ICU. Tear film breakup time and Schirmer's values were recorded before starting the treatment. Exclusion criteria being slit lamp evidence of eye surface disorders, current use of contact lenses, patients on topical anti-inflammatory antibiotic or other medications, ocular surgery or laser treatment and autoimmune disease. So this is a LipiView is a patented technology that measures the lipid layer thickness with nanometer accuracy, captures the blink dynamics such as partial and complete blinks and images the structure of meibomian gland. 
this is a real time visualization of the lipid layer to evaluate dynamic response of lipids to blinking coming to the results 38 eyes of 26 patients were included in this study the mean age of the subjects was 62 years ranging from 36 to 72 years 15 being men and 11 were women mean number of medications used was 1.94 and the mean number of total daily eye drops used was 3.15 this is a table showing patients with different types of glaucoma and different class of anti-glaucoma medications prescribed for treating glaucoma majority of the patients included in our study were open angle glaucoma uh, and normal tension and ocular tension uh, ocular hypertension being four patients and angle closure glaucoma being three patients so when we have charted the anti-glaucoma medications used majority of the patients were on prostaglandin analog followed by beta blockers then carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and then alpha agonists this is a table showing the lipid layer thickness parameters before treatment and after 12 months in patients on single drug the maximum average and the minimum lipid layer thickness parameters before treatment were 80 64 and 55 respectively at the end of 12 months the values have been dropped to 77 61 and 52 and the p-value was found to be statistically significant stating that anti-glaucoma medications has an effect on lipid layer thickness similarly in patients who are on double drug the decrease in lipid layer thickness parameters were found to be significant stating the same that AGMs have an effect on lipid layer thickness these are the pictures of right eye and left eye showing lipid layer thickness parameters before the start of anti-glaucoma medications and after 12 months follow up the average maximum and minimum were normal before the treatment and on 12 months follow up all the lipid layer thickness parameters were significantly reduced discussion longer the duration of topical anti-glaucoma medications and increased number of medications were associated with lower lipid layer thickness Lee et al investigated the effects of topical medications on ocular surface disease and LLT and found that the average LLT in glaucoma group was significantly lower and that one should evaluate ocular surface disease status in patients who are taking anti-glaucoma medications. Arita et al demonstrated that the long-term use of topical glaucoma medications was associated with alteration in memomian gland morphology and function and has contributed to ocular surface disease. Ramley et al showed that the prevalence of ocular surface varied from 37 to 91 percent in glaucoma group and was associated with increasing number of anti-glaucoma medications. So in our current study, anti-glaucoma medications and their duration were associated with lower lipid layer thickness. So there may be a tendency for the patients to have lower adherence to the prescribed treatment. Therefore, assessment and monitoring of LLT changes related to ocular surface disease has a positive effect on treatment adherence and ultimately prevent worsening of glaucoma. Conclusion. Patients on long-term glaucoma medications need to be assessed for lipid layer thickness to evaluate their ocular surface health. In glaucomatocytes, the duration and increased number of topical glaucoma medications were associated with lower lipid layer thickness parameters. Ocular surface disease is strongly related to treatment compliance of topical glaucoma medications. These I are I my references. Stop, actually, Thank you. Time. May I have some questions, please, from the panel? I just asked you one question. Regarding the double uh, drug uh, medications, now are you using as two drugs because basically it's related to the preservatives. Now, if you're using a fixed drug combination, so are you using as as double drug as being put by as two drops, or are you using it as one? Sir, uh, we are using <coughs> the single bottle drug. It's like a fixed. FBC, sir, actually. In a single body, we are having two drugs. So, not see, two basically, uh, ultimately, the ocular surface disorder is uh, meant, uh, is because of the preservatives. Yes. And in the fixed drug combination, the preservatives are obviously less, but the number of medications is more. But you have basically shown a chart where you've shown that the double uh, drug, I mean, the uh, double drug inpatient using to the effect is more. How do you explain that? Yeah. Uh, we understand that you used it as two medications, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. sir actually, in single drug and double drug, actually, there was a decrease. Sir, but patients who are on double drug, actually, it was still more, the lipid layer thickness was further affected, actually, sir. Okay. Because there, the two drugs are there, and even the preservative also. So it is like almost three components adding adding to the... Okay, no, ac actually, sir, actually, we didn't do uh, study on the effect of preservative, sir. I had done only yeah. on the drug, sir. So in this study, the drug has an effect on the lipid layer thickness. So basically, I think this is an observation that you have made uh, okay, uh, regarding we are, we are two out of time now. Yeah, okay. We have to go on to the next paper. Uh,
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'll be discussing the 12-year incidence of intraoperative expulsive supracordial hemorrhage among glaucoma surgeries at a tertiary care hospital in South India. Now, my objectives are twofold, to analyze the incidence of ESEH and to highlight the steps that can be taken to prevent this complication. A rupture of the long and or short posterior ciliary artery can cause blood to pool in the supracordial space. This condition is referred to as supracordial hemorrhage. The abrupt extrusion of intraocular contents through a corneal or scleral defect is a characteristic of the expulsive form of supracordial hemorrhage, which can present, present either intraoperatively or have a delayed presentation. Now, for this study, we will take a look at the intraoperative form of expulsive supracordial hemorrhage, which was uh, diagnosed based on interoperative findings and confirmed with a post-operative B-scan. Some of the risk factors for ESEH will include sudden decompression of the anterior chamber, leading to a sudden decrease in the intraocular pressure, uh, myopic patients, aphakia, systemic conditions like hypertension, and preoperative high IOP. Now, postoperative hypotony is the most common ca cause of delayed ESCH. Any intraocular surgery possesses a risk of ESCH. High preoperative IOP and sudden decompression of AC are more common in glaucoma surgeries, which would explain the higher incidence of ESCH when compared to other surgeries. Now, this is a retrospective observational study that includes all glaucoma surgeries within a study period of 12 years. Only intraoperative ESCH was included and delayed presentation of ESCH was excluded. So a total of 27,461 cases were analyzed. There were eight cases of intraoperative ESCH, which gives an incidence of 0.03%. Now one case in 2010, four cases in 2013, and one case in 2014 occurred during combined trabeclectomy and cataract surgery. Now two cases in 2014 occurred during trabeclectomy. So one point to note here is that because of the occurrence of ESCH from 2010 and to 2014, from 2015 there was a change in the protocol followed in the institution backed by risk stratification, which I will discuss later. Now all of the six combined procedures were trabeclectomy with manual small incision cataract surgery and five of those cases had post rent of the posterior capsule. The post-operative vision of these patients was poor. Nucleus delivery was the most common step at which ESCH was noted. The most common intraoperative finding that alerted the surgeon to a possible complication was sudden hardening of the eyeball, in addition to other signs like sudden severe positive pressure, constant prolapse of the iris through the tunnel, or opening and the inability to place sutures while closing. Sclerostomy was not indicated in all of the patients. So uh, in all eight cases of the ESCH were confirmed postoperatively with a B-scan, apart from hemorrhage in the corporal play space, Two cases had retinal detachment and two cases had vitreous hemorrhage. Now, hypotony and IOP fluctuations are thought to be the primary pathogenetic mechanism. Abrupt hypotony results in the development of high trans arterial pressure gradient, which cause the short or so long posterior ciliary artery to burst and bleed in the supracranial space. Now, complication can occur during any intraocular surgery, no matter the proficiency of the surgeon. It is very important that we are able to identify signs of ESCH intraoperatively, which include a sudden increase in positive pressure, which can lead to shallowing of the anterior chamber, the inkling and bulging of the posterior capsule, loss of red reflex, hardening of the eyeball due to an increase in IOP, and sudden extrusion of the intraocular contents. Now, the higher risk of ESCH in trabeclectomy, also seen in our study, may have prompted a change in the way glaucoma surgeries are approached. Now, countries like Germany, the United Kingdom, and Australia have shown an increase in alternative surgeries over the past decade. So to conclude, I would like to talk about a system in place in our institution that has helped keep ESCH at an incidence of 0.03%. Now, we divide glaucoma patients that require surgery into three grades in ascending order of severity with an increased risk of complications. Now, grade one includes all glaucoma patients with open angles, no systemic comorbidities, and IOP in the target range or less than 20 millimeters of mercury. Grade two comprises of patients that need glaucoma and cataract surgeries, controlled systemic comorbidities and IOP up to 25 millimeters of mercury and closed angles. Patients with an IOP between 25 and 30 millimeters of mercury and other glaucoma conditions that do not satisfy group one or two come under the uh, third category. Now the idea behind the grouping is to help the surgeon decide on the surgical modality of choice with ease and with a clear understanding of the risk involved. So the take home message would be Expulsive supracordial hemorrhage is a dreaded complication, but avoidable. It can be prevented by taking appropriate risk stratification measures. 
opting for non-filtering surgeries for appropriate patients, immediate identification and quick intraoperative management, which includes stopping the surgery and closing the wound. Thank you. Yes, yes. So, did you mm. modify the tunnel size also depending on the grade or the severity of the glaucoma, or it was a simple thin lens to everything, all the patients? Uh, so ma'am, yes. Uh, among the cases that we had, uh, we did the combined surgeries. We had one which was a mature cataract. So, in that case, we had to have a large tunnel. Uh, whereas the rest were IMC. So, based on that, so not based on the grade of uh, glaucoma, but rather based on the grade of uh, cataract, we adjusted the size um, of the mm -hmm. uh, incision. No, ma'am, we did not take that Th into this account. This is a retrospective study. Yes, sir. Yeah, retrospective. Right. So, so, that, uh, so what happened was... A lot, lot of things are, I mean, hard to find. Yeah. But do you, do you have in record yes, that sir. all the trabeculectomies or combined procedure were done under Manitol or not? And, uh, and yes, sir. So among the six I that I we Even after the IOP control, right? Uh, yes, sir. So among the six that we did, two were given preoperative uh, Manitol uh, during, you know, in the block room before they were taken to the... Uh, surgical theater, whereas the rest were not, not because of uh, IOP, but because it was already so controlled. Even previously. with the manitol, they had the uh, choroidal hemorrhage. Yes, sir. Those cases. Yes, sir. So, so thank you very much for this uh, very interesting study. Uh, I just want w uh, to ask you one last question, Sorry. that the incidence in the paper that you wrote up by Dr. Gede was very high, and you mentioned here also, and the incidence was very low in such a large series of cases. Yes. Do you have any explanation for that? Is it just Caucasian and Indian eyes or something else, actually? Sir, it is Caucasian, but as whereas they also took a couple of things into concern. Their sample size was less, much less than what we but had. But they have a higher... The they had a much so higher that's incidence. that's not an important issue. Uh, yes, sir. It's so uh, what they took into account was both things. They had took into account both intraoperative as well as... I think one of the reasons that you included the non penetrating surgery, all uh, the previous studies have, have uh, quoted uh, intraocular thing surgeries. So yours is non penetrating You've included that uh, yes, thing sir. also. That's why I think... You've tried to show that is your this thing is nil. I mean, I don't know why you've added that. It's not required. It should be intraocular surgery. Then you should uh, compare with the so-called expulsive hemorrhages. Not by including that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes. Dr. Bhavesh, so Please keep to your timing, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Five minutes, sir. Functional relationship diagnostic rapid analysis. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Rohit Kinde. I will be presenting my paper on structure function relationship <coughs> and diagnostic value of macular ganglion cell complex measurement using Fourier domain optical coherence tomography in block room. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Standard automated perimetry has people. been widely used to assess visual function in glaucomatous eyes for staging and monitoring the disease progression. It has been estimated that at least 25 to 35 percent of retinal ganglion cells must be lost before producing significant abnormalities on visual field. Therefore, developing methods to quantify retinal ganglion cells related to glaucomatous damage changes could lead to glaucoma detection at an earlier stage and more accurate tracking of glaucoma progression. Optical coherence tomography allows for non-invasive imaging of glaucomatous structural damage involving optic nerve, peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, and macular region. Macular ganglion, ganglion cell complex includes all innermost layer, retinal layers potentially involved in glaucomatous damage, RNFL, ganglion cell layer, and inner plexiform layer. My objectives were to evaluate the relationship between visual function and macular ganglion cell complex thickness measured by FDOCT. And another objective was to evaluate the diagnostic value of macular ganglion cell measurement comparing to RNFL thickness and macular thickness using FDOCT in detecting early, moderate, and severe glaucoma. It was an observational cross-sectional study carried out at tertiary eye care center in central India over, 20, over 18 months. Minimum sample size required per group was 35, and regression analysis and ROC curves were used for statistical analysis. Eyes without any abno relevant abnormal ocular history or examination and eyes having primary open angle glaucoma were included, while eyes with angle closure glaucoma and secondary glaucoma, eyes with any ocular pathology, or eyes with myopia worse than minus 6 diopters were excluded. Eyes were grouped into primary open angle glaucoma and normal group. Further, they were classified according to modified Hadar Hodap Anderson Parish reading scale into early, moderate, and severe glaucoma. All subjects underwent the following examinations during a single day. Slit lamp examination, aplanation tonometry using Perkins tonometry, gonioscopy, fundus examination, 
with indirect, direct, and slit lamp bio microscopy using 90D. Automated refractometry, standard visual field testing, and FDOCT after two kilo dilatation. Results 84 eyes were included, of which glaucoma, glaucoma disorder 42, and normal 42. Early were 12, moderate were 2, 12, and severe were 18. As the severity of glaucoma increases, the mean deviation and pattern standard deviation increases significantly, while RNFL thickness decreases significantly as the severity of glaucoma increases. GCC thickness decreases significantly as the severity of glaucoma increases. However, in patients with glaucoma patients, as the severity of glaucoma increases, macular thickness does not decrease significantly. As can be seen here, peripapillary RNFL thickness and macular GCC thickness at similar structure function relationship with visual field sensitivity best explained by curvilinear functions of regression analysis. Similarly, peripapillary RNFL thickness and macular thickness had similar structure function relationship with visual field sensitivity that is P pattern standard deviation best explained by curvilinear functions of regression models. Macular thickness did not yield st stronger structure function association. While well, considering diagnostic values, early glaucoma, the diagnostic value of mean GCC was greater than that of the mean RNFL, but difference was not statistically significant. The diagnostic value of mean GCC and that of mean RNFL were greater than that of macular thickness. Inferior RNFL was best able to diagnose the early glaucoma, while in moderate glaucoma, the diagnostic value of macular thickness was greater than that of the mean RNFL thickness, which was better than that of the mean GCC. Superior RNFL thickness was best able to diagnose the moderate glaucoma. For severe glaucoma, GLE was best able to diagnose the severe glaucoma when macular thickness compared to mean GCC thickness and mean RNFL thickness, macular thickness had greater diagnostic value. But this discrimination in diagnostic value between macular mean GCC thickness and mean RNFL thickness is not better than by chance. The results of this study of for RNFL and mean GCC thickness were in conformity to the previous studies. However, there are no studies which have compared these results with macular thickness. In our macular study thickness, Macular thickness was able to diagnose moderate and severe glaucoma better than the RNFL and GCC thickness. This could be explained with the flow effect. In conclusion, I would like to say that relationship between visual field sensitivity and GCC was best explained by curvilinear functions of regression models. Mean RNFL and mean GCC thickness had similar diagnostic value for early glaucoma, but not better than macular thickness. And mean macular thickness was better for moderate glaucoma, while for severe glaucoma, GLA was best able to diagnose the severe glaucoma. Under limitations, I would like to say that this was a cross-sectional study. Sm sample size was relatively small, and further larger studies are required to endorse the study results. These are my references, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Would any of the colleagues have some questions? So I, uh, you know, I just want to, uh, I just want to ask you that uh, you know you consider macular thickness as a parameter yes, when you yes. comparing the ganglion cell thickness of the head. Yes. It's a rather dull parameter there because the other thing that you know is that you mentioned that GCC thickness was inferior to RNFL thickness for the detection of moderate glaucoma. So I don't know whether you actually took a look at the deviation maps of ganglion cell because you know that's the first thing that you will see and deviation map if you have moderate degree of RNFL loss, the deviation map of ganglion cell loss would be fairly significant loss. So I don't know whether it had something to do with the machine and whether it didn't give you the, uh, you know, the re yes, deviation sir. maps and so you couldn't, you know, the but that's something you need to go back and yes. take a look at once again. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Just one question. Uh, as sir said that you included the macular thickness. Now, what uh, was the rationale of including the macular thickness? Did you expect that it'll change uh, in the glaucoma? Because we're already using very specifically GCC. Yes, just for comparison reason, with, uh, while considering it's all the three letters or the you three can just parameters. You know, you know uh, in GCC also, we uh, use the glaucoma complex, the same cells. Yes. We use the, uh, the ganglion cell, we use the RNFL. But where is exactly what we need is just simply the GCC we want to know. But since we can't measure that, the uh, instrumentation is such that we cannot measure that simple layer. So there's a problem in measuring that. So we all the three layers are measured usually. And then to include all the layers of the macula, I mean, that's a bit, uh, I, just, I can't expect. Yeah, right. this <coughs> Thank you. I, we Thank got you. the gist, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning all. The topic of presentation is treatment outcomes of plasplenum vitrectomy, hyalidotomy, zonlectomy, and hydrotomy in malignant glaucoma. Malignant glaucoma is defined as uniformly flat anterior chamber with a patent PI, and it's considered as a refractory entity. 
The aim of the study is to study the efficacy and safety of flasplana vitrectomy, hyaluronectomy, zonalectomy, and hydrotomy in malignant glaucoma in Indian eyes in a tertiary care center. <coughs> the medical records of malignant glaucoma patients between December 2018 and August 2022 were collected. The patient who underwent the surgery were included in the study, and the IOP number of anti glaucoma medication and presentation and follow up were recorded. This is a surgical procedure where the plasplana vitrectomy is done with 5,000 cut rate and 650 aspiration rate. Then the hyalidotomy is done. And finally, uh, the sonolectomy and iridotomy is done to make the eye unicameral. This is a procedure and anatomical success was defined as deepening of the anterior center anterior chamber. Complete this, uh, success is defined as IOP less than 21 without any anti glaucoma medication. Qualified success is defined as IOP less than 21 with anti glaucoma medication. And failure was defined as flat anterior chamber or IOP more than 21 with anti glaucoma medication or those patients requiring a second procedure. Coming to the result, 32, 36 eyes of 30 patients were included. Mean age was 70 plus or minus 10 years. 35 eyes were pseudophagy. The cataract surgery was the most common primary procedure in 66.7 percentage. B scan was done in all the patients, and none of them had any supracoroidal uh, series. And this is the three patients had aqueous pockets on uh, B scan. S there was statistically significant improvement in the mean visual acuity post procedure with a p value of 0 0.001. Duration between the primary procedure and malignant glaucoma was mean duration 18.2 days, and the mean duration of development of malignant glaucoma and surgery was 2.61 days. 13 patients were operated on the same day. There was statistically significant reduction in IOP in each visit with a p-value of 0 0.001. IV mantle was given in 17 patients at the presentation and 22 patients 30 minutes before procedure. There was reduction in anti glaucoma medication statistically significant with follow-up uh, with a end of uh, follow-up visit with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Atropin 1 percentage ointment was continued one month post-operatively and at six months follow-up, 19 patients were not on any anti glaucoma medication. 8.3 percentage, that is 3 out of 36 eyes failed at 6 months. 44.4 percentage, that is 16 out of 36 eyes achieved complete success. 17 out of 36 eyes, that is 47.22 percentage achieved qualified success and a total success of 91.6 percentage was achieved. This is the kaplan mayer analysis curve for complete success and the qualified success. Coming to the discussion, mean IOP presentation was 37.39 and fo final follow-up was 13.79. There was uh, statistically significant reduction and the reduction of IOP was comparable to the previous studies by Rajital and Zarnowski et al. Mean number of anti glaucoma medication at presentation was 2.64 and at final follow up was 0.38. And there was more the reduction in anti glaucoma medication compared to the previous studies by Raj et al., Bala Kantru et al. There was 97.22 percentage achieved anatomical success and 91.6 percentage achieved total success, and none of the patient had any relapse. The total vitrectomy with vitreous based shaving that is done in this particular surgery prevents a secondary blockage of the tunnel that is already created and it prevents any recurrences. There are various previous studies, but they analyze different different modalities of surgeries. This is one of the studies with a, a larger number of eyes, which analyzed this single surgery and found out that there is no relapse in these cases. This is preoperative. This is one patient, 83-year-old patient, combined surgery, and patient IOP was 63 at the time of presentation, and the patient was having a flat anterior chamber. And this is a post-operative showing deepening of the anterior chamber. IOP was within normal limit, and patient was not on any anti glaucoma medication. This is a bilateral case of malignant glaucoma post uh, SICS, and both eyes underwent the surgery. And right eye uh, AC is deep with 14 is IOP, and patient is on single anti glaucoma medication. Left eye IC is deep with IOP 18, and patient is not on any anti glaucoma medication. So what this study adds to the previous studies as larger sample size in comparison to the previous studies. It exclusively assessed this particular surgery and found out that the success rate is around 91.6 percentage. Anatomical success of 97.22 uh, percentage is seen. And none of the patient had any recurrences. And there is a reversal of the aqueous misdirection due to the tunnel effect. In added to that, the total vitrectomy and vitreous space shaving done in the surgery prevents the secondary blockage of the tunnel that is already created. To conclude, even though malignant glaucoma is considered as a refractory entity, plasplana vitrectomy, hyalurotomy, zonalectomy, and hyalurotomy surgery can achieve favorable outcome with reduced chances of recurrence. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. I mean, just one question I would like to ask. <coughs> How many days before you took up for a vitrectomy, they were medically managed? 
and How what kind of yeah and, and what kind of medical management or any other procedure was taken up before the transplant yes sir they were managed based on the iup first we will start on uh, with uh, patients who are given mannitol if the iup is more than like 40 and then some many patients we have taken only patients post pi so if the patient only underwent cataract surgery we do we uh, did a yak pi then again reassess the patient and took the patient then only malignant <coughs> diagnosis of malignant glaucoma was uh, confirmed so those patients who underwent combined surgery, if they present with the malignant glaucoma, they were taken on the, some of them were taken on the same day. And that is the procedure. Uh, any of the patients un had undergone a YAG hydrodotomy? This patient, no, no sir. No, we no, we excluded no. those so patients, sir. Okay, right. We took only those patients who underwent YAG PI, and after that underwent the surgery, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. For thank you, sir. morning all. Uh, efficacy of ab internal revision for trabeculectomy blood failure. Uh, so trabeculectomy is the most commonly performed glaucoma surgery but with time it gets failed because of subconjunctival and subscleral flap fibrosis. So there are uh, management options <coughs> to revive failed trabeculectomy blood bar like needling. Uh, so uh, needling is more useful in case of uh, subconjunctival fibrosis and uh, encapsulated blab, but in case of uh, subscleral flap fibrosis, it, it is a relatively blind procedure. On the other hand, uh, the blab repair uh, via external approach is more surgery because it requires uh, conjunctival dissection and reopening of the scleral flap. So ab internal revision, uh, blab revision, it is a less invasive procedure with more controlled and predictable approach. So uh, this is the global Falman by planar sclerostomy spatula, no financial interest. So. Um, the distal end of uh, global Falman spatula is 20 mm long and the width is 0 0.5 mm and uh, uh, the tip is uh, flat, blunt and uh, so the side are cutting and the tip is blunt so it allows the dissection uh, of uh, subscleral and subconjunctival fibrosis and uh, it has slightly anterior curvature so that it can fit in the along the curvature of globe. So uh, the aim of this study was to assess the safety and efficacy of ab internal blab revision. Uh, so patients with failed and scarred trabeculectomy blab with patent sclerostomy were included in the study. And uh, in all patients, pre-surgical treatment with MMC was done five to seven days prior to surgery. It was an OPD-based procedure. Subconjunctival injection of uh, MMC, uh, 20 microgram was given in region of failed trabeculectomy blab. And we also started topical steroid drop. So uh, this is the surgical technique. So uh, this, uh, this is the right eye and surgeon is sitting temporarily. And uh, so I will show a small uh, video. So surgeon is sitting temporarily and uh, this is the scarred blab. So uh, we are making a paracentesis almost 180 degree away from the uh, scarred blab. And uh, then pilocarpine and viscoelastic is injected. And uh, with help of gonioscopy, we are inserting the sclerost uh, this um, grover palmaris spatula in the sclerostomy. So this is the indirect gonio uh, lens. And uh, in the inferior mirror, we can see the uh, scl spatula going inside the sclerostomy. Once it is inside the sclerostomy, we remove the gonio lens and then with sweeping movement or side by side movement, we are uh, gently dissect the scar tissue. And uh, once it is in the subconjunctival plane, so once it is in the subconjunctival plane, the blue tip of the spatula is visible in the subconjunctival plane. The end point of this procedure is um, a shallowing of the anterior chamber with formation of the diffuse blip. So total uh, 23 patients were included in this study and uh, mostly patients were primary angle closure glaucoma, approximately 50%. Mean age of failed trabeculectomy blab was 5.35 years and pre-ab internal intervention was already done in 11 patients including re-trabeculectomy needling and external blab revision. All patients completed one year follow-up but uh, after one year, um, six patients lost to follow-up because of COVID <coughs> pandemic. Intraocular so this is the um, so intraocular pressure. It was pre-surgery. Intraocular pressure was 23.08 mm of mercury, which decreased at one month follow-up. It decreased to 15.91, and uh, at one year, 13.5, and it maintained uh, to 14.6 at three years follow-up. And uh, this is the line graph showing change in anti-glaucoma medication. It was 3.72 before ab internal blab revision. At one month follow-up, it was. Um, 0.54 at one year follow up it was 1.3 and three years follow up 1.6 at all uh, visits uh, it a statistically significant difference was then p uh, and p value was less than 0 0.01 uh, the complications high femur was noted in five patients and um, four patients in four patients it was spontaneously resolved and uh, high femur washout was needed in one patient there was no other serious complication like choroidal detachment corneal or lens injury or supracoroidal hemorrhage 
so total success at one year follow up was seen in uh, 82.6 percent eyes and out of which complete success where intraocular pressure was maintained without need of anti glaucoma medication that was seen in 39.2 percent patients failure was um, seen in 17.4 percent of patient uh, there was no cases of hypotonia or failure because of uh, 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 raised intraocular pressure so here are some pictures of uh, so this is the pre-operative flattened scarred blab and ab internal blab revision was done. This is post-operative day one. We can see the diffuse blab and this is the three years follow-up. And we can see the low diffuse filtering blab is maintained and intraocular pressure is 14 mm of mercury without anti-glaucoma medication. Another patient with two previous failed trabeculectomy, superior and uh, superior temporal failed trabeculectomy blabs and uh, ab internal blab revision was done. Here we can see the diffuse blab is maintained. Uh, formed post of one week and uh, we can see the fluid uh, in the subscleral flap uh, space and post of three years the fluid is still there and uh, intraocular pressure was 14 mm of mercury without anti glaucoma medication to conclude ab internal blab revision we found it uh, a safe effective and minimally invasive intervention as it doesn't require reopening of the conjunctival flap and scleral flap and uh, so uh, this is spatula is reusable instrument and uh, the learning curve is required but it can be learned by uh, most of anterior segment surgeon thank you Thank you very much, and uh, I, I did want to ask you that your results appear to be relatively better than most other studies, actually. You know, that's, this is from the review that you wrote up, actually. Was there something in your technique that you might say that, you know, we did much better and, you know, this is what worked, actually? Uh, sir, MMC, five to seven days that before That was there session. in the other. In fact, I was coming to yes. that as the next question, huh. that the dosage of MMC that you used was uh, much less than what uh, other people have used. And did that help, or do you think that using a slightly higher dose might have led to even better results, actually? There may be chances of hypotony. There was no hypotony in our okay. um, patients. And uh, so uh, MMC was given, and we also started topical steroid eye drops. And uh, in post-op post follow-up, uh, we also give the blem massage, sir. Okay. And uh, 5 FU also. In some patients, okay. if there was corpus growing of the vessel, so. Okay. Mm. You know, one of the most important things when you do some, because I, I you know, the time that it took for the trabeculectomy to the time that you did that was very big, isn't it? That these were not post -operative. Actually, it was the mean, and one patient, it was 17 years, so, so maybe. That's right. So that's I'm just right. coming to that. Was there <coughs> anything that you identified? This is very special. It's very important. Was there anything that you could identify that this is a group of patients that's likely to do well? Sorry, sir? From all your patients, were you able to identify that there was this group of patients that was likely to do very well, actually? In patients with uh, like multiple surgeries, like uh, uh, in aphakic patients, uh, the blab revision w result was not good. And if it is just trabeculectomy and we are doing the blab revision, the result was good. But in case of aphakia or uh, s multiple surgeries, like pars planar vitrectomy in one patient, it was already done. So the result was poor in the those cases. More chances the of the morphology had any effect. You uh, see, there were encapsulated uh, blabs also and the flat blabs also. Was there any difference in the two uh, uh, and the, the results? the outcome? Uh, sir, in case of subscleral flap fibrosis, if there is subscleral flap fibrosis, if there yeah, is I'm just, just asking, there, there were two yes. types. You see, it yes depends, sir. according to the literature, it depends on the in physical properties of the blab also. In we can try, sir, needling, like, uh, because there is Secondly, in the original study, as sir said, uh, you used less uh, concentration uh, compared to the original one. He d he they used four microgram and used only two one. So my question is, uh, there was no uh, shallow complication in that study also. The question, the result was based on the outcome success rate. That was 77 something percent. And yours is uh, much better than that. So in spite of using less concentration, you had a better result. I'm not talking about the complication. Even that study didn't show any complication. Maybe we are better dissecting the scar tissue and all. All right. Okay, I mean, these are all difficult okay. questions. There are no easy answers to them. But we just wanted you to think about these. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I have a same patient with split fixation. As I'll be noted, trochromy is a most commonly performed performed surgery. <coughs> and uh, after that, the glaucoma surgery, the loss of vision can be due to inflammation, cataract formation, hypertony, and macular edema. Wipe out phenomena is an idiopathic loss of central vision documented in significant percentage of the eye after the advanced glaucoma surgery. Men extractor are the older age group, history of coronary, surgery, uh, coronary disease, 
సీబీఆర్ సీబీఆర్ పోస్ట్ ఆపరేటర్ హైపర్ టోనీ ఈ స్పెట్ ఫిక్సేస్ అండ్ ఆన్ హెచ్ఎఫ్ఏ సో వాట్ ఎవర్ ద టెన్ లా వర్ లిటరేచర్ సజెస్ట్ రిపోర్ట్స్ ద విజన్ లాస్ ఆఫ్టర్ ద ఫిల్టింగ్ సర్జరీ హ్యావ్ బీన్ లార్జ్లీ రిప్రెస్పెక్టివ్ అండ్ మే నాట్ హ్యావ్ ద మోడర్న్ టెక్నిక్ అండ్ స్టాండర్డ్ టు ఎవల్యూట్ ద హౌ వై ద పోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద విజన్ ఇస్ లెస్ సో ఎయిమ్ ఆఫ్ అవర్ స్టడీ టు అసెస్ ద ఇన్సిడెన్స్ అండ్ ఐడెంటిఫై ద కాజ్ ఆఫ్ ద విజన్ లాస్ ఇన్ అడ్వాన్స్ డెవలప్మెంట్ స్పేస్ ఇన్ విత్ స్పెట్ ఫిక్సేస్ అండ్ విత్ ఇన్ ద త్రీ మంత్ పోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ పీరియడ్ ఐడెంటిఫై ద రెస్పెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ విజన్ లాస్ ఇన్ ఐస్ విత్ అండర్గో ట్రైబ్ ట్రైబ్ హెకో వర్సెస్ ట్రైబ్ ఎస్ఐసిఎస్ అండ్ టు అసెస్ ద పోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ అసెస్ ద విజన్ అవుట్కమ్ అండ్ ఇంప్రూవ్ ద పేషెంట్ కేర్ so primary objective of our study to assess the incidence loss of uh, uh, loss of vision vision loss post operative complication iol secondly objective to assess the need of post operative intervention and assess the risk factors so the patient included who have the split fixation or the threat to fixation one or more quadrant and have the good visual field reliability visual acuity more than 660 and prevent the trap sis or trap echo the patient who have the visual acuity uh, who can't do the visual field testing or the patient who have the retinal or neuro neurotic disease and proper complication or new avoided these are the standard um, success criteria apart from this criteria we took the iop level less than 18 and less than 15 mmg and iop reduction less than 30% and 40% so these are the basic characteristic we we include this though this is a retrospectively study the bcba iop number of any glaucoma medication and post op complication and the study uh, did the follow up to the one year two year and three years so what the split fixation the sensitivity of 0 degree 0 db and any four of the closest point of 1 degree in 10 dash 2 field and what is the threatening of fixation sensitivity of more than 1 degree 1 db and less than 10 db in any four closest point of 1 degree of the visual field and these are the standard su surgical technique has been used the phonic wake surgery either the fico trap or the sis trap so the post operative vision loss was characterized mild when visual acuity decreased by three lines compared to pre op while in the moderate visual, visual acuity dropped by the four to five lines and the severe visual acuity uh, severe the decrease of visual acuity characterized when we have the more than five line vision loss or the we have the poor visual acuity like the hand movement or finger counting so the permanent vision loss is defined when vision visual acuity do not have the return to the at least three lines within the six month of follow, follow period and transient if the loss of three or more lines in visual acuity had returned to three lines uh, during the post op period of the three months so these are the basic characteristic diagnosis most of this is are the <coughs> open angle glaucoma angle closure and tuber exploration and these these look at the i look at this the iop control from 19 mmg to come to the 12 mmg in the FACO trap group, why in the SIS group, 26 to the 12. So this is this is the only highlighting thing. If you look at the uh, visual equity decline at the three months, so the only three patients have the one line decline and uh, 43 have same. Uh, one line improvement in 20 patients, more than one is 11 patients. While in the, uh, um <coughs> at the six month of uh, follow up period, there is a two line decline in one cases, one line decline in three cases, rest of the patient either have the same vision or visual equity has been improved. And look at the success criteria. So the, the if you look at the different level of type criteria at the IP less than 18, IP less than 15 or 21 MHG. So success at around the 85, 85% into the FACO trap group, uh, 80, sorry, 85 group or the 70 group when we have use the most stringent criteria ip less than 15% and and similar kind of success uh, report into the sis group also and the most common intervention are the lsl suture removal or the blab needling and then coming to complication we have the four so called treatment that can managed by con conservative management so coming to wipeout phenomena if the incidence has varied in the different study possible mechanism interrupt ocular hypertony leading to optic nerve damage and the microemolic episodes in the present study we found there is no significant sudden and uh, sudden or severe vision drop were observed post operatively series were managed conservatively so these are the study have suggested suggested that snuffout or wipeout phenomena is hyper uh, most of the time is a progressive macular thinning and the another study uh, presented by Ronnie George of group and they shows the visual visual loss after the glaucoma surgery is very rare and reversible phenomena so um, the we found in our study the high probability of success rate observed to both group and few case required the intervention like the blem and the sense instant we analysis the both fico trap and the sis trap so just to conclude just in uh, that the surgical the surgical technique doesn't signify impact the post operative outcome sudden unexplained vision loss wipeout phenomena is rare further prospective studies are needed for the larger sample size to confirm this phenomena after trap thank you so much we're a little bit out of time so we have to go to the next uh, i think we call upon the uh, next speaker uh,
डॉक्टर वैभव कुमार जैन प्राइमरी फेको मास्टिफिकेशन एंड एक्यूट प्राइमरी एंगल क्रूजर के सी की विद सर्जिकल आउटकम इज इट आई थिंक नेक्स्ट विल कॉल अपन द नेक्स्ट स्पीकर डॉक्टर राम कुमार जयसवाल विल प्रेजेंट ऑन करेक्टेड आई पी एंड आंसर टू अंडर डायग्नोज ग्लाकोमा इन माई ऑप्स इज इट आई थिंक नेक्स्ट वन विल गो टू डॉक्टर एकता शॉ Okay, okay, okay. Now, Dr. Ekta, you can uh, speak on the, your topic: evaluation of surgical outcome of three degrees uh, goniotomy in primary congenital glaucoma. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to present my work on evaluation of the surgical outcomes of 360 degree goniotomy in primary congenital glaucoma. Now, primary congenital glaucoma accounts for around 0.01 to 0.04 percent of the blindness worldwide, and uh, the definitive management uh, is surgical in this case with these following options. Now, goniotomy is preferred to other surgical options. Why? Because it is minimally invasive, it spares the conjunctiva, and it is also cost-effective. Uh, the traditionally angle surgeries, which has which has been described, they open up about one third of the angle, but uh, the so multiple surgeries might be needed to open up the entire angle so we performed this prospective analysis on the surgical outcomes of 360 degree goniotomy now we included around 52 eyes of 32 patients uh, which were presented to our uh, clinic and uh, patients with pcg with less than uh, age less than 2 uh, years with good corneal clarity so we can see the angle were included and patients uh, with the following exclusion criteria were not included now th i'll show you the procedure uh, first uh, nasal goniotomy is perfor performed using 24 degree uh, 24 gauge cannula uh, as we can see that uh, as the iris is falling back and there is opening up of the angle we can see this and uh, then uh, side is changed and then we perform the temporal goniotomy and following that irrigation aspiration is done and thus we complete the 360 degree goniotomy next uh, we can see that uh, the uh, gonioscopic view of the angle pre and post op in the pre op we can see that there is anterior insertion of iris and after goniotomy the iris can be seen falling back with the opening up of the cleft the patients were followed up for a period of 1 year every 3 monthly and we recorded the iop and the number of anti glaucoma medications of the patients and we defined the criteria of success as absolute and qualified success and now we show coming to the results we see that uh, we have plotted the iop in the pre op 3 month 6 month 9 month and 12 month we can see that there is decrease in the median mean iop in this uh, uh, along this uh, entire duration with a significant p value also we can see that the number of anti glaucoma medication has significantly reduced along the period of 12 month we also plotted the baseline characteristics like the age the intraocular pressure axial and corneal diameter and anti glaucoma medication and the cup to disc ratio of the patients this is a chart which shows the trend in the intraocular pressure and the anti glaucoma medication as we see that the anti glaucoma medication seem to decline over a period of 12 months and also the iop seems to be falling by falling low uh, along this period and we plotted a correlation between the iop and uh, the cupping and axillin but there was no significant result uh, according uh, we found now uh, the success we are uh, rates were uh, complete success of 40% and qualified success was 48% we plotted the kaplan meier survival analysis and we see that the pr fl plot uh, becomes flattened after a period of time and uh, additional surgery was required only 9.61% patient and complication was only seen in 19.23% of the eyes now why goniotomy because it is conjunctival sparing shorter duration lesser complication why 360 degree goniotomy because uh, there is reduced parental stress aqueous outflow channel is not symmetrical so if you treat entire angle in one go it is better and um, multiple need of anesthesia is reduced also it is cost effective in a uh, country like ours now various studies have been performed comparing others uh, others like trabeculotomy uh, it has been performed and uh, there was study which uh, correlated this 360 degree versus uh, uh, traditional but uh, the, they have added good results with trabeculotomy but the trabeculotomy has additional cost of the microcatheter also if you perform trabeculectomy it has a, it uses the conjunctiva there is manipulation of conjunctiva use of anti metabolite and there are blood related complications so therefore goniotomy appears to be safer we have various studies which compared this uh, thing and, and i'd like to conclude that patients with pcg they require multiple surgery so in our surgery in our study we found that the patients undergoing goniotomy were able to maintain 
maintain the IOP for a longer period of time. So this highlights the benefits of circumferential goniotomy, where the entire angle is treated at one go with significant lowering of IOP and number of anti-glaucoma medications. Thus, this <laughs> buys time for further intervention if it fails in future. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. Yes. When the baseline pressure was lower, the pressure reduction was also on the lower side. We but noticed. In the in a way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma but yes. Uh, what was the maximum pressure uh, reduction that took place in your st study? Uh, the maximum pressure reduction, which was noted, yeah. or yeah, which was noted. Yeah. Yeah, sir. It was around uh, 20 to 30 percent pressure reduction was noted. The maximum, the maximum, which is obviously in a very few number. Also, the sample size is not very much. We are conducting, and we would like to present our results with a larger sample size, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma then, then we have to change the size uh, site, ma'am. The surgeon is sitting first temporarily and doing the nasal goniotomy, including the superior and inferior as much as we can. Then the surgeon changes the site. And then we change the position of the patient also and the microscope also. And then we. No, 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 no need to stand. We can do it. Just we have to uh, change the position of the head of the baby as well as the microscope. It is slightly time taking, but uh, it could be done. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. it also otherwise no no punch it like this in the paper I'll, 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 I'll go and sign it can you bring the attendant fee attendant fee sorry they are doing a lot me not this but I'll do all you punch it yeah 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 Staple, staple. All friends, staple. Yeah, sir. 